Minnesota's most dramatic topography is in the southeast, known as the Driftless Area because it escaped the flattening effects of the last ice age. The region features steep slopes and deep valleys carved from porous limestone that doesn't hold bodies of water, so there are no lakes. The unique karst geology creates sinkholes, caves, and springs that feed cold water trout streams. Fishing is popular here, especially fly fishing for brook, brown, and rainbow trout in the shallow, fast-moving streams. I think when people come to Southeast Minnesota for the first time, they're surprised by topography. It's like, wow, I didn't know you had so much topography in Southeast Minnesota. It's the most diverse part of Minnesota as far as biodiversity. And the topography is key to that because we have these steep slopes and maybe on a south slope, it's a bluff prairie like what we're looking at here. And on the other side of the bluff, it could be a mesic forest or even a relic, more northern, almost boreal type forest. So we have, and then in the bottoms, we have wetlands. So you just have all these different habitat types due to the microclimates created by topography. The bluff prairies are being restored to their original habitat with fewer trees and more open rocky areas that support rare wildlife, like timber rattlesnakes. That's right, rattlesnakes. Most people don't know they're here. And I've always been cautious about a surprise encounter when hunting in the area. But last spring when the DNR's Sean Fritcher invited us on a search for the venomous reptiles, I wasn't about to say no. Right now we're walking to a spot that's historically had snakes at it. And when I think of rattlesnakes down here, Sean, I'm thinking of like rocky ledges, uh, out, rocky outcroppings, cliffs, things like that. Is that kind of where we're headed? Yeah, exactly. So they do often use bluff prairies, dry rock outcrops for wintering um, dense sites, hibernaculum. Um, but once they um, come out of the den in the spring, they warm up, they need the sun to thermoregulate, then they do disperse just down into the under the woods. So how close do you think we'll get to some of these snakes? You know, if we're quiet, I think that we can get within even, you know, a few feet, four or five feet of a snake, but you really have to be quiet. If they hear us coming, they will immediately start to, to move under a rock or a ledge and they'll disappear if, um, if we make much noise. They're really pretty docile and um, uh, skittish. You ever been bit? <laughs> no, never. Um, it's a very rare occurrence for um, anyone to get bit by a rattlesnake in Minnesota. We're gonna slowly work our way down the hill here and look at a few rock on crops, a few ledges, and just see if something's out sunning itself. Got to do some pretty cool things with this TV show, see some pretty cool landscapes, and this is one of the most beautiful landscapes I've been a part of. We came upon a couple rattlers almost immediately. Seeing how uninterested they were in us being there, I realized a surprise attack isn't likely. Striking distance, say it's uh, body length or so, um, maybe a body and a half. So you have to be pretty close to a rattlesnake to be in striking distance. So it's unlikely you're gonna get that close without them rattling at you or you seeing the snake. They're not aggressive. So you see one, you stop, keep your distance and just observe. It takes energy to, to make that venom. So um, they don't wanna bite you. They know you're not food. We continued on and found a group of snakes enjoying the midday sun. It looks like there are several of them tucked right underneath that rock ledge in the shade. You know, I'd say there's at least five, six, seven. So there are some characteristics of rattlesnakes that really make them easy to identify. One is the triangular head. But then when you just look at a rattlesnake, they have bands, so black bands down their backside and a black tail, last third of the tail is mostly black, and of course the rattle is pretty characteristic. We just saw the mother load of rattlesnakes out there. From what I've been told is that this was a really good day on seeing snakes out there. 
I gotta tell you, I got the heart pumping just a little bit seeing those snakes and getting that close. And not only are you are you getting close to rattlesnakes doing this, but you're on a pretty steep slope. So we're on, on our way to one of the bluff prairies that's been burned, but as we make our way down the trail here, you can see in the woods that this is an area that's been burned as well. And what, what did we get rid of with this burn and what's still here? Well, when you look across the understory here, you can see all the little shrubby things, all the, all the shrubs are top killed. So they're black right now and it just looks more open than it did prior to the fire. And if you do that repeatedly, eventually the wood starts to open up and the ground flora diversity increases. Coming out of the woods, we see a prairie in recovery. Fire over successive years will, will limit brush growth and allow the prairie plants to recover. We have lots of prairie plants here. This is a sunflower. This is a blue-eyed grass, this purple flower. We have a lead plant here. So it's a recovering bluff prairie. In late August, we went back to the bluffland that had been burned in the spring. And now you can see it's just a lot more lush. Late summer, early August is when the prairie really comes to life and just a lot more species in, in flower. Real soon the grasses will start to turn various shades of red and golds and browns and the prairie's just at its best late August through September and early October. This has been burned once every three years for that 20 year period. And now the buckthorn is almost um, absent um, and it's been replaced by, I see lots of woodland sunflowers, pointed leaf tick trefoils, black snake root, other native forbs that are kind of sun loving. So it's working. Conservation Corps burn boss Dustin Lohman leads many of these burns conducted by AmeriCorps crews on about 6,000 acres annually in southeast Minnesota. The goal is to bring bluffs back to their original condition. Pre-settlement date, you know, fire would, would run up these bluff prairies every few years from lightning strikes or from, you know, natives that would, that would set them intentionally. Um, <clears throat> for habitat. Majority of, of these bluff prairies didn't have any trees and if they did they would be on the top or on the sides and historically they were always like burr oaks. Over time you know we're continuing to burn further into the woods to try and bring that native prairie back. The bluffs provide a great opportunity for wildlife conservation because it's tough or impossible to farm them. They're important for rattlesnakes, but they're important for a lot more. Prairie butterflies in other parts of their range are starting to, dis to disappear on us. And they are as well having trouble right here in Southeast Minnesota. So without these bluff prairies, we think they'd be in even bigger trouble. There's, there's a lot of opportunity to manage for common five line skinks. One of three lizard species in the state and, and one that this area is very important for. And so if we care about those things, even if we don't necessarily care about skinks and butterflies. Um, the, the, managing this landscape requires resources. When we do this habitat management, we think it helps keep snakes in their habitat and helps keep them out of people's backyards. They were here first and if we can continue to fund and do projects like this where they belong, maybe they won't, they won't be seen in town or they won't be in somebody's backyard. So. Keep them, keep them where they, they belong. And what we really care about is, is maintaining this community for lots of other species besides rattlesnakes. Plants, insects, birds, and, and, and this kind of scenery happen if we, if we manage for rattlesnakes. <laughs>